I've been through dozens of personal development phases. There was the Wim Hof method, there was intermittent fasting, there was no fap, there was cold showers, there was meditation, and all of these things have come and they've gone, but three phases have stuck. And when these three phases are combined, the overlapping sphere is where insane power can come. When you can really feel like you've got the mindset that works for you to allow you to live an incredible, fulfilling, rich life where you're consistently making progress. The first concept is essentialism. Now I wanna shine as much light as possible as I can on this concept, because it's helped me earn a lot more money. It's helped me feel like I'm not rushing around and that I'm consistently making progress. It's helped me just feel like I'm living life in the correct way. The second concept is minimalism. Now, I wanna clear up a massive misconception that most people have about minimalism. Minimalism's not about getting rid of stuff. That's completely a misconception. That's a surface level view of minimalism, and I wanna reveal that to you in this video. And finally, there's intentionalism. Now this is a concept that I've never heard anybody talking about ever before. It's not on the internet before, but in fact, it's more powerful than both of the other two concepts. And this has been the concept that's changed my life the most. This is the video that's taken me years to make, and I wish I had years ago. It would have saved me so much time. This is the 80-20 of personal development. Enjoy. Now, essentialism is not a phase. It's not one more thing. It's not a new habit or anything like that that you can implement your life. Essentialism is a completely new way of thinking and a new way of living. It applies to your career, it applies to your health, it applies to your relationship, it applies to your mindset. It applies to literally everything and it's a new lens of viewing reality. So, what is it? Well, if we look at productivity, Productivity is simply an equation of outputs divided by inputs. What are the inputs that this task requires? What does it take? And what are the outputs? What does it give you? And when we look at inputs, we'll notice that we have a limited amount of inputs. We have a limited amount of time. We have a limited amount of money and we have a limited amount of energy. So the question is, where do we allocate this limited amount of inputs? Let's say that each hour of the day that you're awake is one unit of input. So we've got 16 units of inputs that we can use per day. We can either choose to apply each different unit of input on a different activity, and we get one unit forwards in 16 different directions, or we can apply 16 units of energy in one direction. You see, the word priority originated in the 1400s and it meant the first thing, the most important thing. And it stayed that way for around 500 years. This is the main thing that you've got to focus on. This is your priority. Then in the 1900s, only a couple of hundreds of years ago, priority turned into priorities and a new word was originated where people could have more than one focus and focus on multiple different things at once. That change in language shows where the change in mentality has gone. Well, we're now putting our energy into loads of different places instead of into one. A brilliant quote by Stephen Covey goes, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The core premise of essentialism is that it's possible to get more with less. It's possible to do less, but do less things better. A great example is imagine that there's somebody, they wanna become a writer and they also wanna become an actor. The thing to understand is, becoming a writer alone without anything else is an incredibly difficult task. And becoming an actor alone is an incredibly difficult task. So by trying to do both things, you're not able to fully master one of the crafts, so the only hope you have is to try and find the intersection between both of those things. Essentialism says that when you start to cut things out of your life and focus only on what's important, that's when incredible things can happen. And this is something I've noticed dramatically in my own life. But even if you do just pick one field, you only pick writing, there's still a whole lot of signal and not a lot of noise. For example, when I started doing this whole YouTube thing and I started putting my thoughts out there, I was on every single platform. I went everywhere because I thought that was the best strategy to move forwards. What I didn't understand was how difficult it was to master just one of those platforms, let alone hundreds of them. So when I removed all distractions and focused on one thing, that was when I was able to make consistent progress towards that one thing. 
So whatever your field is, what is the signal and what is the noise? If you want to be a writer, 99% of your time should go to writing, not any other things, not any other distractions. And by really figuring out what's important, that's when you can move the needle and really make progress and steam ahead of competition. John Maxwell said that you cannot overestimate the unimportance of practically everything. Whenever you ask yourself the question of what should I be doing, you're wasting valuable inputs on trying to figure out what is the best activities to be doing. Instead of thinking what should I be doing with my time, you can focus on getting better at that craft. You can focus on consistently improving day in and day out. But how do you find signal from noise? What is the process that you can use to really identify the few activities in your life that allow you to feel like you're making progress and that you enjoy doing and allow you to become the best version of yourself? Well, here's the process for that. Step one out of five is to recognize that you cannot control all of the options you have. You cannot just create new options. You can't just create new opportunities, but you can control the choice over the options that are already available. Nobody's gonna come and decide for you. Nobody's gonna come and decide the activities that you should be doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Nobody's gonna tell you this is how you should be using your time. You must accept responsibility for that fact. The second step is to be careful about what you change and to always factor in the risk and reward. If you've got a system that's working, if you're making progress towards your goals and you're enjoying the process along the way, I'd be very, very careful with changing that because there's massive risk. By changing something, you could stop it from working and the reward's not that high because it's already working. You're gonna go from good to a little bit better. On the other hand, if you don't have a system that's working, that's the perfect opportunity to change things around and to change what you're doing because the reward is massive. It could go from not working to working and the risk is pretty minimal because if you change something and it doesn't work, well, it wasn't working in the first place. So there's hardly any risk there as well. So don't change what's working and change what isn't working. Step number three, as you're going about the process of eliminating things from your life, instead of looking at what you're currently doing and then cutting things out, start from zero and then add things in. When Gandhi had the mission to liberate the oppressed everywhere, he went about the process of starting from zero. That was what he called it. He got rid of everything from his life that wasn't in alignment with that purpose and only then added things up that helped him towards his mission. If you look at the activities that you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis and you're trying to eliminate the waste to find the signal or to find the noise, it's a very difficult process to do because we're emotionally attached to a lot of the activities that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. There's many things that you do that probably aren't a beneficial thing for you to do, but you keep doing Doing them because you're attached. If you try and eliminate those things, it's emotionally difficult. Whereas if you start from zero, you open up a new Google Calendar with nothing on your schedule, and now you add things in, that's a better mindset to come from, and it's easier to add than to take away. Fourth of all, simply ask the question, what is essential, and eliminate everything else. Now at the end of the video, there's gonna be a worksheet that's gonna to explain to you the step-by-step -step process of actually applying essentialism into your life. On this channel, we take action, we don't just consume, but the main question to ask is what is essential? What is really important for me to do? And get rid of absolutely everything else. It's either a hell yes or it's a hell no. And if you're unsure about certain activities, get rid of them and focus on the activities that you are certain about. And point number five is to be careful about the pitfalls of other people. It's so easy to just do things because other people are doing them. It's so easy to get swept up in the status quo, but you've got to stand against that. You've got to say no to people religiously. Your default answer shouldn't be yes, it should be no, to help you stay focused on what's important to you. I've taken this to the extreme where I have a shortcut on my laptop that whenever somebody offers me an opportunity, I have a default response where I reply to them and say, thank you, but no thank you. I'm staying focused on what I should be doing just to get it in my mind that I've got to stay incredibly focused. A focused life focused on one thing, focused on a few activities is an incredible life. And when you really apply these things, you really start applying essentialism in every area of your life First of all, you stop doing so many things so you stop feeling so stressed. And second of all, you focus on the things that really matter, the things that you enjoy, that make you happy and fulfilled, and the things that help you make progress. 
On the concept of minimalism, I have to clear up one misconception that I see everywhere. Minimalism is not about getting rid of your stuff. It's not about getting rid of your stuff. It's not about giving it away or donating it. It's not about giving away your stuff. When we go under the covers, minimalism is more about making room for what really matters to you. Minimalism is actually about questioning what adds value to your life. And by getting rid of the things that don't add value, by getting rid of the clutter, there's more room to focus on your core values. Now we're gonna talk a lot more about core values later on in this video, but most people are possessed by their things in three different ways. First of all, most people are possessed by clutter. Everything that you own is a thing that your mind has to think about. You see your cupboards full with loads of different objects. You have a car that sometimes breaks down, so you have to go and repair it. Everything you own is a space occupied in your mind, and the more things you own, the more space in your mind that is occupied, which means the less space there is for you to focus on your core values and what's really important to you. Second of all, you're possessed by your desire to buy. Advertisement works in a certain way where they understand that people buy when they're in pain and they buy thinking that the product is the solution to their pain. So by constantly having a desire to own more, the truth of the matter is there are very few things in your life that actually give you happiness. There are very few things that you can buy that genuinely increase your happiness. Most thing is just like the hedonic treadmill. You buy it, it feels great in the moment, you feel happy, you feel excited, you feel thrilled. When you click that button on Amazon, the one click buy button, it feels good for a short period of time. And then you slip back up. But having the desire to buy is being possessed by advertisers. And third of all, most people are possessed by their expenses. By having an expensive lifestyle, by buying all of these different things, by having high monthly expenses, you become trapped because now if you're faced with the opportunity to get a job that you prefer, but you earn less with that job, you can't do it because you're possessed by your expenses. By minimizing expenses, you have more freedom over your life and more freedom to pick the jobs that truly give you satisfaction, as well as the freedom to spend more money on the things that genuinely matter to you. And on top of all of this, we're possessed by conspicuous consumption. We buy things that we don't care about to impress people that we don't care about. And this is an epidemic that has plagued us. We buy a new house because of what other people will think about us. We buy a new car because of what other people will think about us. So we're trapped, we're possessed by other people's opinions on ourselves, which again stops us from doing things that we actually want to do. You see, minimalism is a tool. It's not an end goal. Minimalism is not about getting rid of things. It's about having freedom. It's about getting freedom over the things that currently restrict you, which by the way, is the core premise of intentionalism. Now, intentionalism is interesting. Nobody else is talking about intentionalism before. I've never heard anybody use the word intentionalism. But I believe that intentionalism is far more powerful than the previous two concepts and far more powerful than pretty much anything that I've ever heard of before. I believe that intentionalism is at the core for a fulfilled life. If you live like an intentionalist, it's very likely you'll be happy. If you don't live like an intentionalist, it's very unlikely you'll be happy. So what is intentionalism? Well, intentionalism is about asking the question why you do certain things and being happy with the answer. If you're happy with the answer to that question, it shows that you're living that area of your life properly. If you ask yourself, what are the emotions I feel on a regular basis, and you're happy with the answer to that question, it shows you have inner peace. If you ask yourself the question, how do I think about myself? How do I view myself? and you're happy with the answer, it shows you have high self-esteem. If you ask yourself the question, why do I do the things I do when you're happy with the answer? That's great. That's what essentialism's all about. And if you ask yourself the question, why do I own certain things and you're happy with the answer? That's great, because that's what minimalism's all about. In reality, intentionalism 
is at the core of both essentialism and minimalism and so many other personal development concepts. It all comes down to intentionalism and being intentional with how you live your life. Intentionalism is about carefully questioning, inspecting and really examining different areas of your life, being intentional with the process of doing that. Intentionalism is about creating a life that you're happy with instead of just going with the flow. Now there are three steps that allow you to live an incredible, fulfilled, intentional life. Stop following the status quo. If you don't create your own life, somebody else is going to create it for you. It's going to be under somebody else's intentional life instead of your own. If you do normal things, you get normal results. Life is like you're a kayaker on a river. If you just drift and you just let yourself float, you're gonna end up going down the river, but what happens if there's a dam at the end of the river? What happens if the way most people live their life and society tells you to live your life ends up taking you towards a place that you don't want to get to? So intentionalism is about putting effort into actually rowing on the kayak away from the stream of the river towards a life that you're happy with. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to live a normal life. I want to be abnormally fulfilled. I want to have abnormal inner peace. I want to be abnormally successful and I want to have an abnormal impact. And in order to do that, I can't do normal things. I have to do abnormal things. So intentionalism is about reasoning from first principles instead of reasoning by analogy. There's a video in the top corner if you want to go and watch that to drill into this more. But basically, reasoning by analogy is just doing things because other people are doing them. Whereas reasoning from first principles is about breaking things down to their core constituent parts and then assembling them in a way that matters to you. Instead of just doing what everybody else is doing, examine all areas of your life, break them down to its core principles and then reassemble them in a way that brings you fulfillment, that brings you meaning. Some examples of this is really questioning, do you want to get married? Do you want to have kids? Are you happy with the job that you're in? Do you want to live in the city that you grew up in? Most people don't ask these questions, they just do what everybody else does. But an intentional life, a life of happiness and fulfillment, is creating answers to those questions that really impact you and impact your life. But the number one thing that's stopping people from living that intentional life, a life of fulfillment, is caring about what other people think about you. Which leads us on to the second point of intentionalism. By definition, stepping away from the status quo is going against what other people think about you. But an intentionalist doesn't care about that. An intentionalist makes decisions for himself and does the things that he knows is gonna bring him fulfillment. That is the recipe for a great life. A perfect example is why are you on social media? Are you just on social media because that's what everybody else is doing? Are you happy with the answer to the question why are you on social media? I'm so grateful that Simon from the Sidemen, after watching my video on social media, actually went ahead and deleted Twitter live on his podcast, purely because he knew that he was only on Twitter because of what other people thought about him. And that's a perfect example of intentionalism. Making decisions from yourself, not caring about what other people think, because you know that that is the secret to a fulfilled life. But also, it's hard to figure out what is the correct decision. How do we figure out what decisions to make and what decisions not to make? That leads us on to the third point of intentionalism about core values. Now, core values are incredibly important. They may be boring, but if you live by them, you live a fulfilled life. Core values are like a compass. So when you're going about the chaos of life, you can always look down on this compass and it's always gonna direct you in the direction to allow you to live an incredible life. And you have to understand that your life is a sum of all of the decisions you've made. Every decision you've made previously has an impact. There is always an effect to the cause and those decisions create either a good life or a bad life. So by being able to navigate the big decisions, like whether you should go to art school and the small decisions, like picking up a paintbrush every single day to paint something, to become an artist, core values help you navigate both. 
And when you start making the correct decisions, that's when you make correct decisions consistently over time leads to an incredible life. And I was talking about core values to people at Time Theory and Cade actually came to the realization that there are three pillar core values that everybody should have that allow you to consistently live an incredible life. The first one is freedom. By having a core value of freedom, it means you can readjust your life to fit whatever you want to do. For example, if you want to take a nap, having a core value of freedom allows you to do that. If you want to quit your job, freedom allows you to do that. If you want to work in a new place, freedom allows you to do that. And on top of all of that, core values change over time. As you mature, your core values change. But if you have the pillar core value of freedom, whatever your new core values are, you're going to be able to readjust your life in order to fit your new core values. Second pillar core value is growth. I believe that pretty much everybody gets fulfilled by improving themselves. It's just an innate part of being a human being. So by having a core value of growth, you're going to improve yourself, which is going to make you fulfilled. But on top of that, whatever you decide to do with your life by growing, you're going to be able to do it. If you decide to quit job, the skills that you've learned from your previous job, the personal growth you've had from your previous job, the improvement you've of your character that you've had previously is going to translate to other areas of your life as well. And the third pillar core value is improving others. I believe this for two reasons. First of all, by helping others, you're going to feel more fulfilled yourself. It's just with innate within human beings. And second of all, by giving, by giving value, the way the world works is chances are you're going to get something in return. You're going to grow and you're going to feel more freedom which again are the two other core pillar values. These pillar core values spill over and impact all other areas of your life. They're like catalysts for all of your other values, which is why Cade and I believe that they should be the core values that pretty much everybody should adopt. But chances are you're going to have other core values that are specific to you and that really resonate with you. When you're going about the process to try and find these core values, to find the compass that allows you to navigate reality, to find the compass that helps you make correct decisions on a day-to-day -day basis, you've got to create space. Now we live in a world where thanks to phones and thanks to music and thanks to headphones, we can go about our entire day and never give ourselves a single second of space for thought. If you're waiting at the bus, you pull out the phone. If you're at a traffic light, you're listening to music. And because of that, we don't able to step back and really evaluate what are the core values in my life? What things are meaningful for me in my life? And intentionalism is all about finding that. Now, again, on this channel, we are people that take action. We are time theorists. So in the link in the description, you're going to find a worksheet that's going to walk you through the exact process that you need to go through to find your core values, to find the things that are meaningful for you, which again is going to help you make decisions on a day to day basis. So go ahead and click that link in the description. And if you want to see more videos on intentionalism, then like this video and comment down below because there are hundreds of different concepts that I have in my mind around intentionalism that I would love to share with you. I truly believe that this has the power to become come bigger than minimalism if executed correctly and if it resonates with you guys I think that together we can make this a massive incredible thing that has huge impact on the planet so if you want to see that like this video comment down below and if you think anybody would benefit from intentionalism just let them know and I'll see you in the next video